Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Zoom for this week. Um, we have gotten quite a bit done. I guess we can start off with uh, the wallet audit has been completed, and they gave us, uh, uh, I guess. Not, not completed. Well, preliminary. The, the, preliminary preliminary in. the preliminary view has been completed, and they gave us the green lights on that. So that uh, has allowed us to now release uh, the next wallet. So the, everybody will be seeing the wallet. We'll be making a tweet about it uh, a little bit later today with the official release date. Um, but you should consider that to be coming out relatively soon. Um, not Tritium soon, but uh, soon, soon, the real soon. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, kind of what we've been working on under the hood, um, we've just been, we've got everything code complete. So we're just kind of going through doing a production suite is kind of the main, main things that we've been doing. So we've been working, I finished up the contracts. We've been doing some more scaling tests. I'm finishing up some extra additions to the ledger and the network to kind of fortify the system. Um, finishing up getting some of the events processor. We have our full API spec. So what code complete means is that the actual API specifications and everything that is is, is not gonna change anymore. Um, and we've been running multiple test nets. We have uh, staking, uh, ledger, everything's working. I mean. Last, what, two, three weeks ago, uh, when you guys saw some of the load tests, I mean, we had the network under incredible load tests. So we've been basically doing a lot of private test nets, doing load testing on the network. Um, I'm finalizing, finishing my last uh, two layers as far as production suite, which production suite means going through, making sure you catch all to-dos, writing a lot more unit tests to make sure it's good, um, doing a lot more dynamic testing, settling everything in. That's where we have kind of our, our naming system now. Um, which works very well um, with the namespaces, purchase namespaces, um, integrating in some of the fee model um, that kind of came out of the last Zoom meeting that we had, um, which I think we have kind of come to somewhat of agreement, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, um, that we're, we have moved away from the burning model. Um, people thought that was wasteful. We're going to lock a lot of the fees up in an actual reserve. And that reserve um, is gonna have maybe a certain amount um, based on the number of transactions processed, it's going to actually be withdrawn from it. So there will still most likely be a, a plenty amount of Nexus in that reserve, which is not going to be, um, it's not accessible by anybody, essentially. You have to create new network rules for that to be. So we're going to kind of leave those funds in there for quite a while so that you'll be able to have at least a, a perspective of how much has been locked away, um, but it'll still be spendable for a rainy day in the future um, if, let's say, the, the DAO decides to have contracts associated with the community contracts or anything else. We're still deciding exactly how we want to implement that. Um, what else do we got? You wanna, do you wanna take it from here, Paul? Yeah, just on that, there's been a really good discussion going on in the uh, uh, economics working group um, around what to do with those funds. And yeah, I, you're right that I think consensus so far is that we shouldn't, um, but it's now around how you know, how should we use those funds? Should they go to miners? Should they go to stakers? Should they go to both? Should they be reserved and used for um, contracts that people can um, set up themselves? And, you know, there's, there's several different ways to do it. I think given that we're, we're not near to decision on how those funds are going to be used, probably what we'll do for now is lock them up in a reserve. We can see what kind of volume is going into it. And then um, we can probably make the decision around uh, what we do with them in Tritium++, plus plus. would that be what we'll do? Is that, is that the plan? Most likely, yeah. I think, I think in Merck, uh, you can jump in here if you want to, because you've been a big part of the discussion. I think we came to uh, that we want to do just a very small fee, probably 0 0.01 Nexus to actual every transaction that is processed um, that would go to miners and stakers. And then the rest of that would basically remain locked up to be determined what to do with, um, whether that's in the future maybe making more fees go to proof of stake nodes or more to miners or you notice staying locked up. So I guess, I mean, Merck, do you, do you have any comment on that? I know I saw you here. The real soon. Um, uh, he says he's got no mic. Okay. Um, well, I guess the real soon and that requires a hard fork to unlock, not this current update that's coming out. Um, Tritium, the Tritium mainnet does, yes. And um, to unlock the reserves, I think is what you're talking about. Yes, that does require hard fork. Um, so it's not something that can just be done. So when we set this model in, 
Um, we're thinking just keeping it at 0 0.01 nexus so that that can actually start building more profit or profitability for miners and stakers. Hopefully that will help kind of decentralize the mining channels more and then the majority of it would be locked up. Um, and that also prevents a uh, particular, let's say miner from getting a very large fee. Let's say a namespace costs 5,000 nexus or whatever we decide. Um, that will actually be locked away and then slowly pulled out of. And I'm pretty sure that most of that would actually stay accumulated in there so that Yes, at some time in the future, we can decide exactly what we want to do with it, which I think we're going to come up with a lot of creative ideas. And that kind of gets rid of the idea of it, uh, I guess, psychologically being wasteful, but it still gives you the benefits of it being pulled out of the market and out of the supply. Um, so I think that's a pretty good economic model. And yep, and you can see it too. Um, if it's burnt, you don't know how much was burnt, how much was lost. Um, this way, yeah, you see exactly how much has been accrued and how much value, potential value, I guess you can say, is stored up in the fee market. Um, the, you just made, raised a good point then about you know, what the fee costs are gonna be for um, registering assets, uh, registering namespaces, those types of transactions which we know are gonna um, incur um, the cost, and that cost has to be thought of um, that discussion is still ongoing and is probably more press is the more pressing one because we need to get that to tritium. Yep. So um, yeah, that's probably the next discussion that we'll, uh, we'll we'll bring up in the economics working group and get that get that discussion moving this week. So um, yeah, certainly what it's going to cost to register a namespace and assets and things like that. it's a, we need this balance between um, having it usable but also um, not allowing people just to go out and spam the, the network registering these things. And the same with the, the hybrid too. So this is part of the discussion that we had when we were going through the planning phases of Amin, uh, when Paul and Mike Casey were here and uh, Alex, is we decided that uh, the actually injection of the hashes into the network were gonna require some form of proof of work to prevent type of spamming. But for scalability purposes, we're not going to require a fee for that for a tier one. Um, but when you start getting into higher level uh, hybrid situations, such as you have your network governed by the master sig chain, um, using op authorizer or everything like that will actually require a fee. And that's where you start to quantify the actual fee and the valuation that a specific enterprise has been using the hybrid features for. Um, and then we don't have to go through, I guess, all of the extra steps in order to verify a fee because um, when you're processing a transaction, you're already dealing with those registers and those accounts. Um, but when you have just a random hash that you're injecting into it, um, you're adding a lot more indexes in the database. You have to require a lot more reads. Um, so we found that it was the best for performance and scalability sake to make it absolutely require no processing for the network to actually accept um, hash data into the network, which there are 512 bit hashes maximum. Um, and that gives us a high performance characteristics. And it also, uh, it allows other people to secure their networks from the immutability of the public network. Um, and requiring a slight amount of proof of work for that, all the public network needs to do is verify the proof of work shares on that specific block. Um, and we'll probably allocate a, a smaller portion of the block, um, maybe 10, 20% of it for those hybrid hashes, um, which are only gonna be about 64 bytes a piece. So that um, in that way, we can kind of regulate how much space is actually given to uh, other hybrid networks or other side networks, I guess you could say. Um, sister networks would be kind of the more public ones. Hybrids are the one that are uh, kind of public and private. And that's where the, the actual uh, hybrid sig chain comes in too is because you actually have access control um, through that. And part of the, the architecture of a hybrid network is it actually has the ability to um, have levels of privacy and levels of publicity in it. So um, different users can be allocated different permissions and the validator nodes would essentially give them information that was relevant to them so that they don't necessarily always have access to the global state um, so certain amounts of data can be encapsulated, which is good for medical records and other things like that. Um, but the user would have access to their own specific data. So that's kind of how the hybrid is going to work. And that's where the hybrid SIG chain, I guess, comes in is that that is what is allocating those permissions to that actual private network so that you don't have to have a constant configuration and updating all of those nodes with a consistent configuration all the time. Because if you have that happening, um, <laughs> you're going to run into a lot of issues. You can't update an entire network all at once at the same time. It just doesn't work. So that way you can also set other types of consensus rules and things like that. So um, just a little brief side note on exactly kind of a little bit more color on how some of that hybrid functionality is going to work um, and how we've designed it that way. 
and we have a public namespace that we could make a public library. Um, that's actually a good question. Yeah, we, we can definitely allocate reserved public namespaces. Um, it's pretty easy to do. We already have reserved uh, keywords specifically in there. So if we want to do that, we can set a public namespace. Um, another thing that I'm planning on doing too, which um, it's not necessarily going to come on Tritium name at time, but it's going to be a feature that we build on top of it. Um, since a lot of building, you know, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to start to actually get a build fun stuff with Tritium. It's going to be cool. But um, it, we talked a little bit about TNS, Tritium name services. So um, with Nexus.io, what we're kind of looking at doing is Nexus.io pointing to a custom name server, um, pointing that actual domain name and having Nexus.io as a public namespace that anybody can register a namespace to, or maybe we um, choose who we want to sell those namespace entries to. And what the result of that could be is that if you use your Bind9 name server and have that integrated with the blockchain, it can read records such as A records from the blockchain that are registered under that specific name and add those in as a routable IP address so that from the conventional old DNS system, it can tap into the TNS system that allows you to essentially allocate subdomains under nexus.io through the public nexus network, which the idea of that is actually moving into kind of component-based website design, which um, I'm writing a paper on that with Juliet. We'll probably, I don't know, next week sometime, give you a little bit more detail on that, which is another really fun feature where um, we're moving nexus.io to be that, as you see the site as it stands right now. Um, it is more enterprise focused. Um, it's got kind of the, you know, the enterprise vibe to it, which is good because we want businesses to be able to have their own, but that's gonna move to enterprise.nexus.io and we're developing two other sites that are gonna be uh, community.nexus.io and technology.nexus.io. And then uh, a public WordPress that would be uh, news.nexus.io and then obviously the wiki on top of that and then have one, bridge page that essentially allows you to click to each one of those links. And so that's kind of a precursor to, I guess, a TNS system because eventually when we develop this new set logical and interface layers, um, you'll be able to deploy on the L5 stack. So L5 is Linux lower level library and Lisp, which essentially what that means is um, it's a stack and it is some of you old, old timers know um, part of the idea of developing the lower level libraries to eventually replace some of the existing internet stacks. So the LLD outperforms MySQL, the LLP outperforms Apache. So what you can essentially do is use the L5 stack, deploy it with a type of React framework on top to be a component, and then integrate that in through uh, the TNS system. And from that TNS name that's registered as that subdomain, that becomes the master SIG chain that controls that sub, it's not even really a network, that sub service which essentially allows us to create component-based website design, which allows websites to be actually decentralized. And the management of the website itself is decentralized. So we're gonna start Nexus.io being an actual decentralized website where you know the biz dev and enterprise guys are gonna manage the enterprise.nexus.io. And then we'll bring you know, a community working group together to manage the community, um, the community.nexus.io, and then us devs will manage the technology.nexus.io. And that's kind of our first step to then eventually have the deployable React framework that anybody can deploy on top of an L5 stack to create any type of new service within their existing service system um, and allow, I guess, decentralized governance of that, which could eventually move to DAOs, um, regulating that specific one instead of a single sig chain. So um, we'll write a paper on that um, with a little bit more color. Um, it's cool to see the lower level library is finally uh, matured enough to, to be capable of all this with uh, you know, the HTTP LLP and the lower level database. Um, if we wanted to make it completely replace the existing LAMP stack, which stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, um, we would essentially just have to write a MySQL module over the LLP or a SQL module over the LLP, which would then um, use the LLD as your backup storage engine and each different database instance would be a different database table. So those are some things to kind of think about and turn on that are gonna be kind of coming. Um, we think that's a really good way to, to bring blockchain um, into how should I say it? Something that everybody can use without even having to download a blockchain. Um, just by simply visiting a website, you can have those types of features and start to see that the web can actually become decentralized by managing the actual DNS entries and the site's content itself through kind of distributed consensus um, that would be more DAO oriented. So, yep, sorry for that tangent, but that's something I've been really excited about lately. I figured you guys, you guys might, might enjoy it too. Yeah.
Um, yeah, it's a really good example of, of how easily you can build an application on top of uh, yeah. the next yeah. platform as well. I, I gave the, the DNS example uh, yeah. a few times in Slack over the last couple of weeks because it is a, a really good use case and actually really easy to implement. So, uh, yeah, we can implement that just uh, uh, as an example of, of, of how it can be used and we can apply it to Nexus.io. Yeah. Um, but the, the namespace is are going to be used for much more than just uh, DNS and thinking about a web server. So it's, 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 it's just a way to partition data. Um, ultimately, that's what it is. It's just a way to partition data, which is what DNS kind of does. Yep. And to point data and use levels of the direction to point one piece of data to another. So, you know, you'll be able to buy and share names and sell names on the decks and all those different types of things because we want we want the namespace to become somewhat of an investment. So when you purchase the namespace, then you are gonna sell names under that namespace. So it's gonna be something that's desirable. And more and more people having accounts, more and more people having contracts, tokens, they're gonna want a desirable name that everybody can reference instead of having to have this big, long 256-bit hash for the register address. They'll be able to just reference a specific name associated with it. And by doing that, you're gonna make it a lot more uh, readily available for everyday users. Um, send to, you know, Paul's check -in. All those different types of things so that's that's going to be another it's a pretty exciting thing to see it kind of come to life and uh pretty exciting to see the decks kind of come to life which segues and that's today's demo as well uh just a simple token to token decentralized exchange which should be fun and uh the conditional uh how should i say the conditional system being in um, essentially allows you to create any types of stipulations um, on any transaction that is uh, between two parties so that's namely transfer claim debit and credit those are your main ones that actually deal with two different sig chains. And <clears throat> I could put a condition and say, you know, I'll debit to you, Paul, um, you know, but if it's within five minutes, then, you know, you can claim it. But if it's after five minutes, then I claim it back to myself. And there you get a reversible transaction that, you know, expires after a certain period of time. Um, anything else like that. I mean, there's the sky's really the limit. I mean, it's kind of cool because we've built all these these different subsystems and now they're all put together and now it's coding on the code that we just coded, which is pretty cool and finding all these really cool practical applications for it. Um, so conditional statements uh, are pretty quick too, which is nice. So we shouldn't really see too much of a burden on the network. Um, and that's where you start getting a lot of really cool smart contract functionality. You could even say, you know, I'll debit this to you, Paul, if this other person's register has this value of this, and then you'll debit to me if this other person has this value of this, so that as soon as that person writes that value to that, then all of a sudden we can both credit back, and then there you got an escrow system. And then you can get even more complex if you want to do multiple SIGs and anything else like that. So um, that's where I guess a lot of the really cool complexities of the contracts comes in, and it makes it feel like a contract. Ethereum is just this blanket open source code where you just, you know, code it and they say, oh yeah, well it's a smart contract because you can program it. But you know, it, it doesn't have the logic of a smart contract. It doesn't have the logic of a normal contract because a contract is just an interaction between two people, two entities. So in this sense, the two sig chains represent the two people and the conditions represent the stipulations of that contract. And the, the conditions have to validate to true in order for that contract to actually execute and be fulfilled. Is non-custodial exchange from external blockchains possible? Um, anything possible? As far as it's designed right now, we don't have anything implemented to be dealing with external blockchains, but more people that actually implement the Tritium, let's call it the Tritium stack, or if they start using the virtual machine or some of our operations layer, then that'll make that more and more likely right now. Um, we do have a function to work between UTXO and Tritium. Um, that's near complete, which is kind of one of the last little things that needs to be actually put on Tritium before we can release the mainnet. So being that our, our logic understands that there is certain possibilities of doing that. There's also other possibilities of other tokens actually going cross blockchain um, somewhat to, I think metronome does that where you have a burn on that blockchain and then it is created on the Nexus blockchain, which could be representing another token for that. So, Long story short, we don't have that right now, but that's definitely something we're considering in the pipeline and in the future in order to create true non-custodial decentralized exchanges that also don't have a lister. Most of the decentralized exchanges I see now, um, they're not really decentralized exchanges because you have to pay a listing fee to some central authority, which um, isn't really a DEX. I mean, if, if you can't just list any asset or any token you have um, at any time on there without, you know, without anybody's permission, that it's not a truly decentralized exchange. So. 
Um, we envision, I think, is going to be a pretty, pretty colorful ecosystem, I should say, um, with your ability to do decentralized exchange because um, one of the powers comes in when you can actually transfer assets or I can sell an asset to Paul or I can put an, a sell order to Paul or anybody that I really decide. And based on the conditions being fulfilled by a certain price that I put on that, um, then Paul is able to claim that asset. So you have non-custodial asset exchange too, or asset for asset. And that's where you can start to sell names, name spaces, um, anything else. Like, you know, you may have a, a car or a title or a deed or, you know, anything else like that. So um, yeah, it, it's going to be a really important feature, I think, for all of these other things um, to truly, to truly take form. Otherwise you rely on centralized infrastructure um, in order to honor any of those assets being valid for something. Um, in this in this way, we don't. So we're completely free of that and free of middlemen. Um, let it being regulated by math. It's great. So you were just talking about conditions there, um, and um, this is the the nomenclature that we're using for validation scripts now. Yeah, it changed the name from validation scripts. Um, validation scripts. I mean, I have uh, an op validate in there, but yeah, conditions is kind of the 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 name when I went through my production sweep what I have decided it was kind of more, um, I guess, intuitive. Yes, yeah, it, makes, it makes a lot more sense, I think. And um, just to clarify for everyone, um, you're gonna be able to set these conditions via the API when you create a transaction. Um, and I mean, eventually we can build API methods that will create you a transaction obviously with, with certain types of conditions built in, uh, you know, just, just create me a reversible transaction within five minutes or those, those kinds of conditions. Um, but the, the more advanced conditions where you're going to want to script them, um, that's something which uh, will be available via the API, but we're probably going to have to do some work to uh, some explaining and some examples to show people, hey, this is how you will set up an arbitration triangle. These kind of use cases, these common scenarios that you would that you're going to see people are going to want and you know we can just create examples of those um so that people can sort of refer to that and give them a, a point to learn from so that'll be coming too yep yep and i mean the api is very highly modular and easy to modify so any developers that you know want to create any other stipulations or different types of conditional statements in it beyond just what is supported um, are perfectly capable of doing that um, we probably would recommend against distributing that um, just for the sense of, you know, when you start getting into conditional programming, you do have some potential um, margins for error. And that's one reason that we have developed it all under an API is because everything is standardized and our conditional statements are standardized. And we all check that out to make sure that you don't have any prone or errors, such as, you know, um, an overflow happening, which, you know, um, <laughs> has happened to Ethereum or, you know, I mean, there was like what the parody bug was that he didn't write you know that there was an owner of the actual contract um, and so somebody just like took over the contract and then like got freaked out and then suicided it and that contract was in the global scope and there was like hundreds of other contracts where all this ethereum was locked up in and the death of that one contract locked up 200 million dollars in ethereum which was pretty bad so we 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 like to not have that happen for us. Um, <laughs> so that being that, it's it's not advised to write your own conditional statements um, or, you know, to tweak or, you know, talk with the team or, you know, I mean, get involved in development if you want to do that. Um, but, I mean, you're perfectly able to do that to whatever extent that you want. I mean, the source code's open. And conditional statements don't require hard forks to modify. Um, it's, it's essentially a non-Turing complete register-based uh, virtual machine that has its own, I guess, interpretive language built on top of it that allows you to access the global scope. It's kind of like a little routine. Um, and that's where a lot of, if you guys saw some of the benchmarks where we had, I think what 70 or 80 million multiplications per second and everything. And um, we have a lot of safeguards in place, I guess you can say, um, such as if you have a number and it can only, you know, a number of bits can only store a number that's so big. Like if you have eight bits, it can only store 256 values. So you try to store 257 in there, or 256, which since it's all zero index, um, that's gonna be a value of one and that's called an overflow. 
And you generally don't want overflows to happen. They generally come from uh, programmer error. Very rarely do you actually intentionally overflow unless you're actually a really good coder, but even then like you open it up for other coders to make problems. And um, certain virtual machines like Ethereum don't prevent against overflows. Um, and ours does. If you actually try to send a conditional statement to overflow value, it will fail before the transaction is even broadcasted. Sorry, my son's at the office today. <laughs> He's making dinosaur pictures. If you've heard the door slamming. <laughs> Us all devs are dads, so yeah. You made a good point there about uh, the API being modular though. Um, and it's something that um, we want to drive home that even though uh, we're gonna get to a point where Tritium is released and you know the consensus critical code is, is not going to change until Tritium++, um, we are going to actively develop the API um, continually after that point. We're going to keep, we're going to keep um, putting new functionality into it um, for our users, for our use cases that come up. Just um, you know, we, we understand that we need to make it easier and easier to use. And the the API um, is something that will be a replacement for the command line RPC as well. Um, at the moment, the RPC is still there and functioning. It's mostly there to service the legacy wallet, um, but you can invoke the API, the new API from the command line in the same way that you use the RPC commands now. Um, and eventually they will a replacement for it and we will eventually get rid of the, the, the RPC um, service and, uh, and get rid of those RPC command so over time, we're going to keep adding more and more API commands to serve as replacements for the old RPC and then any other functionality we think that you might need. Yep. Which is where we want people's input as well. You know, it's open source. Even if you, you even if you are not a coder, then make suggestions to us on what you'd like to see. Um, but if you are a coder, then please do um, uh, work with us and um, some yeah. pull requests. We'll review them and see where it goes from there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. So I think that is that pretty much wrapping everything up, I guess. Yeah. I had one other thing um, to talk about before you move on to a demo and that's um, uh, somebody asked me what, when we're going to be upgrading the, the public test net with um, the, the latest Tritium code. And the, um, we've had this discussion internally about when we move uh, merge our, dev code up into the merging branch, which is what the um, test nets have been um, uh, based on. Um, I know we've got some more work to do in the LLP uh, before we get to that point, but um, I think maybe within the next week or two, we should be around in Not a position. Far. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just finished up all my ledger stuff, uh, minus like one thing with the fees and everything. So um, I'm just going to go be going through the network this week and then I'm going to probably be stress testing it over the weekend, all that good stuff. And then that should, yeah. Uh, yeah, that should put us out. I mean, I just, we don't want to launch one if we're going to be changing the network um, and yep. some messaging code. So we want it to be fairly consistent um, for everybody from here onward um, so that everybody can get kind of a good idea of all the nice little gizmos and gadgets inside of it. So yeah, probably in the next, I think two weeks max, uh, you'll yeah, probably more next week. I think is my aim for week of the first, no later than that, which is, um, yeah, that's a week and a half away, week and a bit away. And the, the um, public test sets more for everybody else to start playing with all the features rather than yeah. like, to ensure it's stable. I mean, we've had test nets running. I mean, what the one test net that we have now has been online for like three months, four months now. I mean, it's been really stable. I haven't had hardly any issues with it. So, I mean, yeah, a lot of it's it's good, but we just want everybody to to start to get in and start to use it, and then we'll do one more test net after that, which is an actual activation, where we take our legacy code and then we activate it um, and move it up. So on this public test net, we'll invite people to come, you know, bombard the network with transactions if you can, um, you know, see what you can do, see if you can beat it up, see if we can break it. Um, let's get it into a real live live load test scenario. I think Merck was talking about uh, setting up like a, a backend tip bot or something like that. So everybody can just start test net tipping and things like that and just see if we can just really hammer it and uh, yeah, and get it. 
that would be good if we can yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. With the bot and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll take it slow. I mean, the security auditors are, what, four four weeks out or something? They just, they're about a week and a half in, I think. So we're about to turn them over to this code too. So they're still auditing more of the, the staging. So we're kind of keeping those in parallel. So, I mean, yeah, over the next few weeks, we should be pretty close pretty close with all of that. And I mean, a few weeks after that, we should have uh, the security audits completed. And then, you know, probably another week or two after that, just for like the final rounds of testing and, you know, QA and everything like that. And then, um, yeah, then pretty much mainnet release is pretty much what we're looking at. So, I mean, I'd say, what do you, what do you guess, mate? I'm bad with timelines. I shouldn't. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing, I'm not talking about timelines. Okay. Well, we're, we're looking good. That's what, that's what we'll say. And it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Moving full steam ahead. So you mentioned then about the legacy to tritium activation. Um, and you know, I, I think I know what, what is involved in that, but just for other people's benefits, um, I think there's, there's, there's two parts of it. One is, is kind of the mining and what goes on there and what's going to change. So, um, and correct me if I'm wrong. So this is just my understanding of it. Um, so up until the tritium activation, um, we will still be creating the legacy transactions, um, legacy blocks, but in the new tritium, uh, block format. Um, and the miners will still be creating the old style blocks. And then um, when the activation happens, they'll suddenly start using tritium blocks. And those tritium blocks mean that um, if you're if you're mining, instead of those blocks um, creating Coinbase transactions to a UTXO address, it's suddenly going to then create those transact um, those Coinbase transactions to a SIG chain instead. Yeah. And that's the kind of switch. Um, and the whole block structure too. Yeah. Because transactions um, were broadcast before and pre-processed so that when the block comes in, the block process is much quicker and you don't have to have all the payload on the block twice because what happens like with Bitcoin or anything else is you're broadcasting transactions out. And then the miner mines the block, but they're packing all the transactions in the block as well, which means you know you have uh, twice as much data requirement as you basically need. And that also you know limits your, your ability to scale among Sorry, many other things. So that's also a slight uh, architectural change too with the tritium block as well. And then in terms of the miners, uh, the, the, the only change for them will be that instead of um, mining to a, a legacy address, they're going to need to be logged in with a SIG chain and it will um, mine, to the, mine Coinbase transactions to that SIG chain. Instead. Yeah. Um, and then that's sort of the one side of it is the mining. The other side is um, how do people go from using their old UTXO wallet to using a SIG chain? And what does that mean for services such as um, uh, block explorers and also exchanges? So um, here you go. Somebody's just asked that question. Well, so um, the way we're doing this, we, we understand it's going to be a really big challenge to get um, exchanges to move over to using SIG chains. Um, and we're not expecting them to do that immediately. We're giving them a migration path. And the way we're going to do that is to allow um, two-way transactions from a legacy uh, UTXO address to a signature chain. So you can send that way. And Vice versa, you can make a transaction and send from a SIG chain to a legacy address. So what that will mean is um, if I decide that I want to use a SIG chain to store all my co coins, I can. Um, uh, but if I need to send them to change um, and that exchange is still using uh, the UTXO, then I can just I can still make that transfer and still send it that way. And then vice versa, I can make a withdrawal from an exchange and have it come to, straight to my SIG chain. Yep. Um, Yep, they need that's, to be both ways. Yep. So that's that's what we're going to be doing in the short term so that um, the exchanges are going to need to update to Tritium the same time as the rest of the network so they're not on a fork, but in terms of the rest of the services, it should be completely seamless for them until they want to move to SIG chains. Yep. Um, and then, you know, they, they will need to be work on their side to do that, but they can do that in time. Yep. And Merck's um, 
I need to be able to mine to an, an encrypted wallet. Um, yeah, I mean, your, I mean, your wallet doesn't really exist anymore with Tritium, so I'm not sure what that question. No, so it, yeah, so it's, it's it, there is no wallet. It's not encrypted anymore. It is your sig chain. The sig chain is is no, uh, protected. It's gone. Poop. No, no backups, no graph, whatever. The only thing you back up is your master seed phrase, your recovery phrase, which is like 20 words or whatever. Um, and then you can encrypt that if you want or keep it. Okay. So but I, th I think Merck knows the answer to this and he may be just saying it for everyone else's benefit. The, the way that mining works with Big Chain, you need to be able to... Uh, um, he wants to mine without unlocking the wallet. Um, so the wallet crashes. Um, well, you gotta you gotta log in. So if your wallet crashes just on your startup script, you just gotta fire it up, and then you just gotta re-log in, and you gotta re-unlock. Yeah. So you need to be able to log. You need to be able to log in. Um, okay. No, that won't fly. Um, yeah. I, the, I mean, if you want to sacrifice your security, you can have it as a configuration option. But that, I mean, we can do that for you if you want. It's not that big of a deal. It's like you know, five minutes of code, but. I mean, that does, that does reduce your security because then um, if you do get anything on your computer, especially if you're running Windows um, and they read your config file, your SIG chain is completely compromised. So FYI, I mean, if you want to do that, that's mining to hot wallet. Whatever. Whatever. I think I do understand what he's saying. Um, and yeah, that's fine. To be able to um, generate one-way transactions to a SIG chain without having that sig chain on I mean, just just add it to the config file ball it's easy i mean i i didn't add that for security properties you know but you just you just add you know username password pin inside the configuration file and then when you fire it up you just automatically log in yeah that's easy it does need to be logged in though as is the point Merck, there is it's not a you're not able to just ETXO where you, you know you can generate Coinbase transactions to that address without having um, without without being unlocked essentially. You wouldn't need to if you if you had that address in advance. The only reason you, you need your wallet, wallet unlocked today is because we generate a new address for every Coinbase transaction. Um, but sig chains are different because of the fact that they're chained together and they ch you know your chain changes with every Coinbase transaction, it needs to be accessible and unlocked. We need, you know, we, we need it available. So for what so about a pool? That's a pretty blanket question, but I'll do my best to answer it. I mean, a pool server, you, you just put in your natural credentials if you're mining for that pool server and that's that. Um, I mean, the producer transaction can have extra contracts on it and the extra contracts can actually go to all of the other pool payouts. So. Generally, yeah, I mean, if you have it as a configuration in your nexus.config file, then that could be very easily automated. It's just an auto login process. Um, I would, we, we would not recommend for it um, just because of security. I mean, I went to the point of writing an actual encrypted pointer class to encrypt your sig chain credentials in the memory, even just in case like you get a virus on your computer and stuff. So, I mean, we, you know, we're pretty tight on that, but I mean, if you want to have that option as a configuration option, make it an unrecommended option, which is something fine. And a pool server could simply just type in username, password, pin. It's kind of like, think of it like your RPC credentials. You can't have the whole pool go down because the op can't get to the machine to unlock the wallet. Well, well, I don't know if you heard the last 10 minutes of what I just said. I said you just add it to a config file and then it automatically locks in. Like the problem was solved 10 minutes ago. Cool? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the, the thing that, uh, yeah, I think he's missing is... You, someone needs to create the transaction. There needs to be a sig chain available to be able to create that transaction. You put it in, if, if you want it to be automatic, you put it in your config file. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, that can be done fairly easily. Um, the way that wallet uh, pools are going to handle the the switch from legacy to sig chain, well, they don't have to um, necessarily switch to sig chains it depends on the way the pool's been implemented um the the hash pools that are out there at the moment they um they only mine the coinbase themselves and then wait for it to mature and then just do payouts separately down the line um they could continue to work that way and could continue to make payouts to legacy addresses if they so wish that 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 will still work so you could as a miner, you would still have your legacy, your payments come into a legacy address and then you can sweep them into your 
SigChain whenever you want. If yeah. the if and as and when the pools want to upgrade to use SigChains, um, then the pool still has a SigChain to generate the Coinbase transaction, but uh, all the miners can be can have their payments as as contracts um, contract outputs on that um, on that one transaction. So there's still only one producer, one um, uh, one sig chain creating the transaction, which is the pool operator, um, and then the fee, and then do multiple contracts out to each different sig chain, which is probably like the recommended way that we at least say to do it. Yeah, um, just because it, the pool becomes non-custodial, but I mean, I guess pools maybe don't care about being non-custodial who knows <laughs> yep so the, the yeah if they if want to be want to continue the way they are now where they are custodial and therefore they wait until a block is matured and, and then do the payments then their payment processing side of the thing things instead of making legacy transactions to legacy addresses now they'll just make uh, debit transactions to your signature chain's genesis id or username whatever you decide to give them yep that's what they do so again, there's a migration path for them. They don't have, it's not going to break on day one. Yep. And that's, that's been a lot of, a lot of heavy lifting <laughs> to make the two interoperate. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it needs to happen, especially, I mean, we're, we're creating a model here too, that, you know, eventually can help upgrade other networks. So, I mean, we want to, to make sure that we remain interoperable to the existing old UTXO sets. We'll probably deprecate them towards the end of a mean, um, depending on, you know, how quickly everybody updates. But I mean, presumably, I think it would probably be much more desirable for any sort of um, service to upgrade to the Tritium, Tritium protocol because it, it will be much more capable. Um, using UTXO or legacy transactions would essentially be synonymous with you're using still the legacy system and you have to use a Tritium transaction or a SIG chain in order to use the Tritium protocol, basically. Otherwise, it's gonna feel like the exact same thing, so. Yep. And one more thing on the ledger, I made it um, weight-based now. So um, instead of it being trust-based where it's a plus one and a plus three, Merck, you're gonna like this one. Um, it's actually based off of the actual cumulative proof of work and proof of stake weight. Um, now it's not all three of the channels added together, but it compares all three of the channels so that if you have um, one that is greater than or equal to each of the other three, if one is greater than and the other two are at least equal to or greater than, then you therefore are the best block which is gonna give us a lot higher resistance to any sort of uh, network attacks. Um, it's gonna be much more difficult to try to rewrite the history and it's gonna be more difficult. Um, there's gonna be less orphans that are generally gonna to happen too because um, if a prime block comes in you know, on a hash block and they're competing against one another for the same spot, um, they're both gonna be seen as the same. This prime block would actually have to get an extra hash block built on it in order for it to be considered a valid block um, because it would have to have, and it would have to have a higher weight uh, than the other hash block, which means it would have to have more hashing power. So that's kind of a similar way that Bitcoin has done it. Um, I hadn't really found a good way to do it because we have three channels and you can't really balance these three channels together and say that, you know, proof of stake weight is the same as, you know, hash weight at a certain time. Um, otherwise that would be kind of a cumulative total chain weight. But this way we get a really cool like checking and balancing like we get with our three channels, but then it's all weight based. So if I understand the reason that we do this is to stop any one of the channels running away and if, yeah. if they were to um, overtake a whole bunch of hardware on one of those channels or, or they found an exploit or something that create the, that allowed them to create lots of blocks on any given channel. It wouldn't do anything. They'll get rejected because of the, the weighting. Well, they wouldn't be rejected. I mean, they'd be accepted, but they wouldn't get ever connected. So if you have three channels, right? And let's say they're all at the height of the chain and then you've got a prime block here. And let's say the prime miners just start building up a chain of like 10 prime blocks. Now they're gonna have a higher cumulative weight for the prime, but they're never gonna be able to have more than the rest of the network because the rest of the network's gonna be building up these two, right? So they're gonna have to have a higher cumulative weight than these two in order to overtake it, right? So the prime, basically a single channel trying to monopolize um, wouldn't have any success in monopolizing it, um, which is kind of what the one to three ratio was built for um, before, but now this is actually, uh, I think a lot more of a secure way to do it uh, which is just going to increase, you know, the security and integrity of the chain um, in the future, which, you know, I was really happy about that. That's kind of like one of the last things I did as far as ledger hardening. So it's a really important feature too, for just hardening the chain and also um, lowering our orphan rates. Cool. Cool. Can you please write that down and draw some pics? Um, 
Do you want me to do a demo of a demo? <laughs> um, I'll write something out for you, Mark. For real. What, like here now? Not now. Not now. Not now. Peace me later. Yeah. Okay. For everyone later. Uh, maybe we'll do that on the next Zoom. I'll try to do it. We've got a whiteboard over there. Maybe we'll do a nice little whiteboard session or something. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So, so Dex, what's that, Dex? Clock meeting, what's that, Dex? So. What's that? Yeah, I, I'll do a quick Dex. Dex, you know, I'll type it up. I just, just barely tested this on the API, too, so this should be fun. Let's see. I shall share my screen. Has anyone seen this yet? Because I haven't. Oh, you haven't seen it? Oh, fun. Okay. All right. You guys see this? Yeah? You see the, do you see the terminals? Yeah. Yep. All right. So let's try this all up. Oops. Special text. All right. There we go. All right. So this is always another one of those mind benders because you have to uh, coordinate all these different indexes and everything. But I wrote um, two quick API calls today just to show this specific demonstration. Um, the DEX is going to be in limited form um, on the Tritium release. Um, it's capable of doing it all under the hood, but we have to add a little bit more fluff. Um, you know nice stuff around the edges to make it work a little bit more effectively um, to where you can actually view orders and you know submit and everything like this but I'm going to just be doing it right here so oh I forgot to add multi-user okay so Users create user. I'll go over here. Okay. A couple of typos. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Paul. That's weird. This is this is what happens when Jack pure codes with me. <laughs> He's like, you got a typo. You're missing a semicolon. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Okay. So also, I think I haven't mentioned this. Um, you can change your keys by default. So this by default is Falcon. But if I ran this with uh, Brainpool, I'd actually be able to change my key just like that. So what's really cool about that is you can actually, we're going to support a number of keys so that you can actually, just with a new transaction, completely change whatever uh, cryptographic algorithm you want to use. Um, which means, you know, we can very easily introduce new post quantum algorithms in the future. If we find better ones in Falcon, um, if people don't like brain pool and they want to use like a Bitcoin type key, you can use a Bitcoin type key. If you want to use our, uh, you know, binary SCCT 571 R ones, you can use those. So that's pretty cool. So now I'm going to go users, login, user, username, user one. Just for people who don't know the lingo, brain pool is what we currently use on the network. <laughs> yep. Well, it's what we're going to use. Um, we use um, SECT 571R1 brain pool as an electric curve key. So the trade off is elliptic curve cryptography is a lot more compact. Transactions are smaller. As you can see, these are monster signatures. <laughs> but any post quantum algorithm is pretty big. Um, but the Falcon that we're using is actually the most compact out of all of them by orders of magnitude, and it's ridiculously fast. So, and Falcon will be the new default. Yep, yeah, Falcon is default right now, um, but we may make it just a brain pool default. We'll we'll just we'll decide that, and maybe get some community involvement on it. But Falcon definitely makes the processing much better, much faster. So, Are there any other blockchains out there using uh, lattice-based cryptography at the moment? Nope, nope. 
And it's really nice too because we, we have a very low risk of using it too since we have sig chains. Um, I mean, this public key is not known. This public key is essentially your next hash here. So this this hash is your next hash. So, um, and then as soon as I make another transaction, it's it's not even a key that's used anymore. So we have a really cool hybrid signature scheme, which is what they recommend when you're using post quantum cryptography right now. Uh, most people that say they're using it and you know using it in production is probably not the safest thing, um, unless you use a hybrid signature scheme, which is you either combine it with ECC or something else. I mean, we're combining ours with the signature chain protocol, which is really efficient, um, and it also protects against all of those those types of unseen problems. And since you can uh, change it with just changing a transaction, uh, you simply just go, oh, yep, I, I just want to use Brainpool, and then boom, you got it, which is cool. So um, it's very low risk, and it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's nice that uh, we finally got some good candidates. Uh, this is from the second round, NIST candidates, similar to, you see Blake, um, what are all the other ones, the, the X11 ones? Like Dash uses X11. And X11 was literally like all the second round candidate hashing functions for SHA-3. Um, so second round is pretty good. It got through a lot. I think some cryptos tried to use it. I think some used Bliss, um, which was around one candidate and Bliss, you know, you know got cracked and they were like, whoops. So anyway, all right. So I'm gonna go tokens, create. So I gotta do two things here. So I'm gonna create a token. I'm gonna call it my token. Correct me if you see me missing anything. Paul's Mr. API guru nowadays. I haven't touched the API for a while. Got a session, got pen, and then for supply. I'm gonna make this guy have a 500 supply. And over here, tokens create, whoops, typo. Um, name equals my token to session. I know it's a local namespace, Paul, but I am uh, doing this from my own head. Okay. <laughs> um, this is, yeah, it, it gets your head if you don't know exactly, especially when you're doing like the two sig chain thing going on. All right, so I'm gonna make this one with a supply of 1,000. So we're gonna create that guy. So we're gonna say tokens get, token name equals my token session equals copy paste there we go max supply of 500 as you can see this has come a long way uh thanks to paul he got the nice decimals in there we've got it's looking really nice so it's the the api is getting really close to production this is this is your essential account going on right here and then we go over here token such get token typo Name equals my token to session equals. We're just doing this just to kind of show you guys a little bit what's going on. Oops. Typo. You go. Yep. Typo in session. Oh, typo. All right. There we go. So a thousand five hundred. Right. This is token identifier FF three eight. This is token identifier F seven four. Okay. So now this guy. I need to create an account now. Now it's token, but I'm gonna create an account on this guy for here because we're gonna do a little exchange. Now name, I'm gonna say my account session equals here, and equals one to three, four. Let's do the same thing over here. Tokens create account token equals we're gonna to want to grab this token address let's see, make sure I get it right that's all three eight yep token equals session equals and equals one three four name equals my account so you've set up your two tokens your two currencies you know yep and yep. then uh and they have an initial uh max supply and a balance. Um, none of them are in circulation yet, which is why current supply is zero. Yep. And then in the two windows, you've created an account for the other um, token. Yep. Okay. So now we're going to do a sell. Okay. So I'm going to say my name from what I'm selling is my token. Now, I have to do address too, since we have protections on the namespaces. The address that I want, 
actually name from my token address to which is the account. Actually, I can do name two. You can do name two and just pick it with the other email. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say amount. I'm going to sell 100 of my precious 500, but I'm going to set the price of 200. If you're, hang on, before you press enter, if you're doing name two that way, that's going to go to your my account, not to the other person's my account. I, that's what I'm saying. Um, I'm selling this, um, but I want you to transfer to here. I'm saying like, here's my token. I'm selling this token for you. And yeah. when you buy it, I want you to transfer to me here. Oh, perfect. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah that's right. This, it gets a little, a little wonky and confusing. Sometimes. Understood. Yep. <laughs> okay. So here's our TX ID. Now this guy over here, he goes in to the decks and he goes and pulls a buy. Now he's going to reference this TX ID here. He's going to say, let's see. Let me make sure I got this right. I have to look at the code. Hold on. I just coded this like a half an hour ago. Sorry. Um, name from address from. That's all I need. Okay. So then I'm just going to call it from my specific account here. So since my token two here has that identifier, this guy over here should have that identifier. If we look it up. Um, let's see. It should pull this guy up. So the token is F7. Now, as you see, this is the token I own over here. So I'm going to pull name from, and I'm going to say, oops, oops my token two. Now, in order to purchase this, I need to fulfill the amount which actually this should automatically do that for me, I believe. Let me check. So let's check this out. Oops, missed the pin. Session. And there we go. So now this transaction has officially completed, which is cool, right? So now as you can still see, I still have zero balance in here, but I say tokens, credit token, and I say what it be name equals my account session equals here, pin equals one degree four. And I'm going to credit from this TXID, TXID equals here. Nah. That wrong TXID. Bug, sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. Anyway, let's try this guy over here. Tokens, credit, token, TXID. And this guy is going to be claiming this cell here. Session equals here. Oops. And equals one, two, three, four. And Name two equals this would be my account two. Uh -oh. You don't have the events process. Hmm. You don't have the events process to run automatically pressing these. No, you couldn't do. Not for decks. No, I it should have been. Yeah, but I just did this. Fine. Let's see. Yeah, I should have been doing it just fine. Let's see. Tokens, credit. Oh, wait. Duh. I did tokens, credit, token. My bad. I think that was tokens, my Tokens, credit, account. Oh. Yeah. 
Oops. My account. That's why I was doing it on both of them, huh? Yep. I did tokens, credit token. Darn. I missed that. Yeah, my bad. That's <laughs> see, that's one thing I didn't like about this new this new API spec. Like that that got a little funky. But I guess it makes sense to break these these nouns out. All right. Let's try this again. Tokens, credit, account, TXID. Register pre state doesn't exist. Because I'm using the wrong. Name. The credit uses name, right? Let's see. Um, it doesn't normally. It only does for split payments. I don't know if the DEX is any different, but um, oh, credit I doesn't. Did it. I just did it this way. Oh, that's why I was doing it. Um, that's why I was getting that bug. I didn't realize it was name. Here we go. I'm no name my account. Oh, wait, this guy's my account too. That's right. There we go. All right, all is well in the world. Now let's do that over here. But first, let's check this guy's account. Get count name equals my. You know, you don't need the name equals on there, right? You can just tokens get account slash my account too. Oh, okay. Does it work with spaces? We're going to find out. <laughs> no, let's not find out. Okay. Um, name equals my. I already made enough mistakes for that for, for the day. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm glad it was not a code problem though. Yeah, because I was like, I just tested this, what the hell? It's like, yeah. All right, anyway, um, name equals my account to session equals home. So now you see, I have the balance of 100 from my account because I just bought 100 tokens from him. You see, remember I did the sell and I set my price to 200. So now this guy over here goes to tokens, credit account, name equals my account session equals let's pull this and equals one degree four txid equals boom. there we go all right now we just go back up here and we get account my account and now i have 200 tokens in here so i just over here did an exchange so this guy over here just to recap he went out here, he made, we made all the accounts, that doesn't really matter. And then you do a DEX sell. So he said, I'm gonna sell from this account, but I'm gonna tell you, you have to send it to this account because this is where you're gonna pay me. And I'm gonna sell 100 of whatever this token is. But my price is 200 of your token. So this guy said, aha, well, I wanna buy that. So he went and he bought it and he claimed that TXID. And he said, here's my token that I'm willing to send to you. And then that executed, right? And then on the other side of that, what that did is that locked this transaction in. If this guy didn't go and do the DEX buy, this guy could actually credit back to himself because part of the conditional statement says that um, I can cancel the order by just crediting back to myself. So at any time, this order could have been canceled too. This was basically creating a sell order. And then this guy went to buy. Now, if I were to create a buy order, I would do it the opposite, right? Where this guy would say, I want to buy this and I will sell you 200 of this token for 100 of mine, right? Or I want 100 of yours and I'll give you 200 of mine. And that's just, it's just a reverse order, but it's the same thing. And then what happened is that executed and the validation fulfilled itself, right? And since the validation was fulfilled, that means this guy was no longer able to actually withdraw from that token account anymore. Um, he is not the authorized validator. He was not the person that fulfilled that condition. So then this guy was able to claim this TXID here with the credit, which then left him with the 200 tokens that were sent here. And this guy was able to credit from him, which left him with the 100. So this is actually uh, a much, I guess, uh, more superior technology to the, than atomic swaps. Even the atomic swaps are a little bit dirty on the security. You know what I mean, because you actually publish the random number um, within the network for the other person to get when you actually spend, which means anybody can have access to that too, which is a little bit scary. But anyway, um, I have to get going in the next five minutes, but this, I guess, concludes this demo. Um, I hope everybody saw that. Sorry for making uh, the little mistake, but uh, everything works great.
so then we'll we will just have um a methods for listing buys and sells um and yep. yep so the the thing that all it needs really for the decks now i mean all of that you saw that was working under the hood for the exchange to actually take place the only thing that we need to do is just have some sort of database that keeps track of all the orders um without having to scan the blockchain and then that way you see all the buy orders and all the sell orders pile up and then you put an asset for sale or you know you go buy somebody else's or you can actually trade tokens and the tokens will trade um, really quickly, they trade just as fast. And as you guys saw, like load tests, we were handling hundreds of transactions per second. I mean, post-processing, I got, uh, what, 10,000 transactions per second is what I was seeing on post-processing, pre-processing 17,000 per thread. Um, so it can scale and it, it can handle quite a bit, which is nice. So, um, I guess till next time, everybody, um, if there's any questions, I think we got some messages. You got that. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Merck. Thanks, Murdaki. Um, nothing, nothing on Telegram, nothing on Slack. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, guys, if I've been absent. I've just been, you know, disappearing and coding and, you know, doing the thing. So if I don't answer, I apologize, but I haven't checked Slack or Telegram for a while. Anyway. Look out for the tweet for when... Uh, Yep. Well, all right. Yep. Yep. Look out for the tweet. We will release that tweet probably a little bit later tonight. Um, yeah. And I guess thanks everybody for watching and uh, thanks for bearing with uh, the typos and we shall see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.